historic context than things that's happening in Europe. But I think it would be also good to look at what's happening right here, right now, in terms of the environment. Environment meaning that not so much, not only as the environment, as a built environment of architecture, but landscape also is part of important environment. And when you make buildings, you always find place in the landscape how to situate your building. Another thing that uh, I find it that it's very unique to Hong Kong is that a lot of times we see some landscape or we see some sceneries and we think that's natural landscape, meaning that was how it was created from uh, geological uh, time. But a lot of what you see in Hong Kong is actually not a natural landscape, meaning it is very altered. And this process is constantly happening. You know, it's not just happening at the, let's say, the waterfront, but it's also happening at different parts and different territory of um, Hong Kong. Just, just for information, you guys are looking at tram as a way to examine some of the ideas that's being discussed in the lecture. But you know where they decided where to put tram? That's, that used to be the edge of Hong Kong Island. So tram, tram line used to run along the edge of water. So everything from tram line to the side of ocean that you see now used to be under the water. So what you see there as a land mass, and when you see there as all these buildings, they were built upon, not a large natural landscape, they were built upon a reclaimed landscape. So these things are happening all throughout Hong Kong. And I think it's something that uh, I, as a you know, uh, person who lived in Hong Kong, has been quite fascinated by that phenomenon as well. And then, without further ado, maybe I'll introduce you to Ivan. You guys want to use this one? Or you want to use this one? Uh, this is box style. I'll do a TED Talk, so I'm not sure. Can you hear me? In the back, you can hear me? I speak like this? No, I think this is bigger than they would use a TED Talk. OK, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, as Jay said, I want to talk about landscape. <clears throat> he promised I'd talk about Hong Kong landscapes. And I promise to frame the discussion in Hong Kong landscapes. But um, I'll also show you some things that uh, that I think inspire me, and that I want to inspire you as you go forward in your careers. But I'll start with the frame. Uh, who's here? Who here is from Hong Kong? Almost more than half. Probably more. Um, so I've been in Hong Kong for about five years. And I, before I joined the university, I was a practicing landscape architect. And when I go back to the US or visit friends in Europe, and I said I was a landscape architect in Hong Kong, they were very surprised. They didn't think there were any landscapes in Hong Kong. Uh, and so they would ask me, well, what, is, what do you do in Hong Kong? And to be honest, I really worked mostly in China. Uh, but there is tons of work in Hong Kong to be done, and there is tons of uh, landscape issues in Hong Kong. Um, so I wanted to start with two maps. The, uh, the first one shows landscape value in Hong Kong. Um, I don't know if you guys can read the key. The, is this mic working? It feels like it's kind of going in and out. No? Um, the, <clears throat> this area here is what Hong Kong government and the experts who did this map call high value landscape. And everything that's darker, which is sort of where we all live, in the dark green, <clears throat> uh, which isn't the best uh, color for showing bad landscapes. Dark green seems to be like a good landscape color. 
anything in dark green is, is considered low value landscape, which is where we all live. And when we look at the second map, which is the <coughs> landscape character, we understand that they're actually talking about the entire urban environment, uh, from everything from the marine uh, port area to the hills that capture water in Hong Kong in the sort of country parks as the landscape. Um, and we're looking here now in green is actually the green landscapes of Hong Kong. And then the red and pink colors are the sort of urban landscapes. Um, <clears throat> this is about as far as the government has officially gone in saying something about the landscapes of Hong Kong. They are sort of underappreciated um, by most of the practitioners. Uh, <clears throat> And landscape issues in Hong Kong are generally approached with a very engineering focus. Um, the professional bodies in Hong Kong of landscape architecture um, are small, frankly, are a little bit weak, um, and have a lot of work to do. The landscape of Hong Kong has been formed by other people instead, because landscape architects haven't been around. So really, the landscape architecture, the landscape uh, character of Hong Kong is, has been created by the engineers by the water specialists, by surgeons, doctors, architects, planners, these sort of people. So in Hong Kong, we have a precedent for landscape being a very inclusive, open field of practice, a very open practice. Um, we, as uh, people interested in the, what do we call the, the sort of physical environment, if we want to include everyone in this room, um, as people interested in the physical environment, <coughs> uh, the landscapes of Hong Kong is the responsibility of all of us in the future. So a little bit of what is the landscape in Hong Kong? What are some is interesting issues? Well, the first issue, who knows what this is? What are we looking at here? Does anyone know? In your history of Hong Kong, this must come up in school. Does anyone know what this is? Yeah, Koshan, yeah, Koshan. So this is one of many, many, many occurrences of landslides in Hong Kong. Something that we don't really see that much anymore, um, but used to be one of the primary, most pressing characteristics of land in Hong Kong, was that land in Hong Kong was unstable. If it rained just enough, it might actually move. And for us, for anyone living in, in Hong Kong or working in Hong Kong, this is an incredible um, condition. The fact that the ground beneath our feet at any moment might slip away. <clears throat> um, and this is something that I think in Hong Kong we really have come to terms with in a very engineered way. A lot of the slopes and um, retaining walls in Hong Kong are the result of these kind of practices. And I'll show you pictures of that in a minute. Uh, but I think I want to argue that this is also fertile conceptual ground for thinking about uh, contemporary practice in Hong Kong, something that is really feeds off this concept of the ground as being unstable, the terrain as being somewhat unknown. And just as sort of proof that <clears throat> landslides in Hong Kong are still happening, that the ground is still unstable, that this is a permanent condition, it's not something that's been solved. These, uh, all of the, <clears throat> all of these areas here show uh, landslides in an area around Tai O that happened in 2008. <clears throat> and we can probably count about 20 different landslips in the hillsides of, of um, around Tai O. So the, the ground is unstable. The ecologies of Hong Kong are dynamic. Um, the geology is dynamic. It's something that's still evolving, still moving. And as landscape architects, as people working in this territory, it's something we have to be aware of. And if any of you have gotten out on the sixth floor, you've seen a map on the, uh, the smaller elevator bank showing this view of Hong Kong. And this was a map done by Ashley Scott Kelly in the Division of Landscape Architecture, looking at the territory, looking at the ground of Hong Kong. And he was actually, the his project was to sort of create a, <coughs> uh, uh, an algorithm that would read flat maps and 
figure out how to um, provide very detailed terrain models. But <clears throat> it also shows, and maybe this is hard to see from your perspective, it also shows the, the, the quality of manufactured ground, manufactured flat ground in Hong Kong. So every time we see one of these oval shapes, which pretty much occur at the back of every red footprint, these are, the red is footprints of buildings, this is a slope that's been altered. It's probably a retaining wall. Maybe it's been a, maybe it was a previous landslide that's been uh, uh, solidified with concrete or, or a structure. But we can see along these roads, like Robinson Road, we see every building has a dramatic alteration of the landscape behind it. And so the territory of Hong Kong, as this map is intended to show, is extremely manufactured from the geology up. It's not just the plants, it's also the ground. And when we look at um, some of the larger building practices and projects in Hong Kong that have happened over the last 50 years, um, I find a lot of inspiration and a lot of caution in the public housing states that were built in Hong Kong starting in the, the 60s, uh, continuing until today. And in these early practices, which again, public housing, has anyone been to public housing in Hong Kong? Your grandmother probably lives in one, you may have lived in one. They're really amazing places. And they're where um, about half of Hong Kong's population live. So I think it's a very valid place to start looking at, uh, at how landscapes are made in Hong Kong. When we look at these, the early practices of building estates in Hong Kong, we find extremely engineered surfaces. So this, um, this, this image of Sao Mao Ping, which has since been rebuilt, and I'll show you a picture of what it's, what it's like now, shows the approach toward the terrain in the early 70s, uh, late 60s, mid 60s. The idea was to flatten, to, to hold and flatten. And this is how most of Hong Kong is made, and this is the sort of territorial condition of Hong Kong. And you can see that <coughs> uh, the infrastructure, the roads you see here, do their thing. The landscape does its thing. So there's, there's a road here, there's a, a, a manufactured slope here. It almost seems like nothing has been really integrated that there's no practice of integration. And that's because there weren't that many specialists in the environment working on these projects. They were primarily made by engineers. Architects came in and did, their, did the buildings on top. But um, as an environment, it's become a, a very typical type of environment in Hong Kong, where the terrain has been um, more or less ignored, and things like um, building efficiency, um, construction efficiency have all taken priority. And this is beginning to change, um, but it's changing in ways that perhaps are not the best. And so I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but <clears throat> this, is the, this is the condition that you guys all have to strive to not recreate. Uh, it's not just the slopes, as Jay mentioned, it's also the, the, the flat ground. A lot of Hong Kong where we live has actually been reclaimed from the sea. This is Sha Tin. Um, more public, public housing estates, but also uh, private housing built in that area. And then uh, just some examples zooming in on those. What, what's created in those? This is uh, Wafu Estate, a short bus ride away from here, uh, where we see huge slab buildings and a coastal edge, which is um, Totally engineered. It's that perfect slope to hold the soil back so it's, it won't be unstable um, uh, and it won't fall into the ocean again. And the building is sort of perched on the edge, very, uh, it seems like it could topple over any time. This is what that looks like today. So, this is another issue in landscape that we have to think about the, the ground, the ecologies actually transform over time. This is where the practice is today. In these public housing estates, which again, I'm just using as an example of landscape practice in Hong Kong. Uh, 
Um, the idea of green, greening, has taken priority. Sustainability has taken priority. But what it means is there's been a loss of public space. So how do we balance the need for actually hard, usable surfaces for people to enjoy, to gather in, and these sort of more sustainable, um, more marketable images of living in Hong Kong? So here we see lots of green, but we maybe can't use this place very well if we're elderly, if, if we don't have children, or if we just want to have 10 or 15 people have a conversation. On the other side, we get public spaces like this in Hong Kong. Spaces that are under buildings, that are just concrete, um, that are very much not used, um, but intended as public space in buildings. So these are all things we have to think about. And it looks like my font changed. Fertile Burr. <clears throat> the title of the lecture should be Fertile Ground. Um, and the way I'm framing this lecture, uh, and we can come back and talk about the, the initial Hong Kong stuff, is that I want to give you five talking points, five starting points, for thinking about your practice. And <clears throat> I think there's two issues to be concerned about here. One is interdisciplinary attitudes. So you're all here together in this room. We're going to go into different disciplines eventually. Um, hopefully you all respect each other, and when you get out of here, you'll still respect each other, and when you graduate from your master's, you'll still respect each other, and you'll be able to work together. And I want to give you some, some seeds, some starting points for ways that you can collaborate or ideas that you'll share as practitioners in different fields. And then <clears throat> disciplinary vitality. What are the things that will give you as practitioners, no matter what you practice, um, uh, something to go forward with. So I'll, I'll mention five points. And I used to, when I was in school, I would always do three things. That's that's like the magic number, right, when you're a design student, three. Now I have a kid, so I always do five, because it's things you can count on your fingers or toes. So we'll have five points instead of three. Maybe some are more fleshed out than others. And if, uh, I don't know if Jay mentioned it, but I'm trained as an architect, um, later as a landscape architect. And a lot of the work I've been doing is more um, at the scale of urban design, urban planning. Um, so I like to think that I, I cross boundaries in my own practice and in my own research. Um, and I hope that you all um, can sort of manage to think outside of your disciplines as well. So here's five points. What year are you guys in? First year? First year. Okay. So stop me if you come across any of these projects. Five things I'll talk about. The first one is messy problems and wicked solutions. Um, you guys all know what messy means. Um, wicked, in this sense, is a, um, a term coined by some um, <clears throat> people actually in, in Berkeley in the 70s, um, some uh, urban planners and sociologists working on social issues. By wicked, they don't mean bad. They don't mean evil which I think is probably the more common definition of the wicked. Uh, for them, they mean complex. They mean tough. Um, there's another, if any of you have ever been to the northeast of the United States, there's another definition of wicked. Um, anyone been to like Boston, spend time in Boston? Wicked, for some people in the United States, means really cool. OK, so I want to use all of those I want to use wicked in all of those senses. And we'll talk about, essentially on that point, we'll talk about complexity. Then I want to talk about the ground. And I'll just show you images about how you can think about something as simple as the ground. And for a lot of you who are architects, the ground often means your site. And so I want to propose that you think about your site in more complex ways. Third, we'll talk a little bit about ecology and different approaches to ecology, um, some historic, some more contemporary. I want to propose that we think of ecology not only as a science, but as a metaphor for a way in which individuals, whether they mean human individuals, you guys, or uh, animals, interact with their environment. And by environment, I want you to think about the urban environment as well as the natural environment. I want us then to think about 
um, briefly, the city, the qualities of the city that we need to be thinking about and concerned about as we go ahead and practice. Um, and I put it as, as a question mark, green city, because um, I want to talk about the role of landscape in urban thinking today, briefly. And then finally, I want to end with some strategies and scenarios. And here I'll discuss a few projects um, where strategic thinking or thinking through scenarios are critical um, design objectives or design approaches. Um, this is in uh, contrast to just thinking about plans or projects as fixed points, fi fixed things we do. So we'll talk about strategies and scenarios as more open-ended ways of, of practicing. So I'll start with uh, messiness, complexity. Um, Hong Kong's landscapes are very messy, are very complex, um, are very much um, uh, sort of self-organized places. Um, a lot of Hong Kong's landscapes have not been properly planned. And so Hong Kong is a great starting point for thinking about um, complexity in the city, complexity in landscape. Um, there's a few uh, keywords I'm showing here. Uh, complexity systems in architecture and landscape, you'll talk a lot about systems, about thinking about systems rather than objects. This is sort of the trend nowadays, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, architects or planners who have thought in interesting ways about systems. Um, we probably won't touch on cybernetics, but that is uh, a sort of science of uh, one way of, of complex thinking and indeterminacy. So the wicked problem, uh, the, way, the, the term I'm borrowing for wicked, um, has been diagrammed like this. So this is your starting point as a, as a design student. And <clears throat> this, this map is sort of a tongue-in-cheek uh, diagram showing uh, uh, what wicked problems mean. And uh, again, uh, wickedness in the design professions, in the planning professions, was something that was uh, sort of written about maybe 40 years ago, and but has still come up every five years or so um, with critical thought and critical thinking on what we should be doing as professionals in the human environment. Um, and the, the most brief synopsis of what they wrote 40 years ago is that Everything is interconnected. Every place you start for a project is new. Every problem is a new problem. Every problem set, in other words, the things you have to think about when you're doing a project, whether it be architecture or landscape or planning, is undefinable. Is You cannot actually put a boundary around the things you need to think about. And then every project you do and you build is actually never finished that everything you do just starts a new project. Every change you make in an environment leads to ripple effects that um, change things outside of that specific project that maybe you'll have to deal with down the road. So the, the <coughs> uh, Horst Riddle and Melvin Webster, who wrote this article on wicked problems, encapsulated the what I think is the major concern about our practices uh, in the last 50 years, which is that there's a lot of complexity and it will never We'll never be able to solve a design issue like we can solve a math problem. Anyway, but a lot of people in school do that. And so the, the joke is that uh, wicked problems are all this stuff here. And then the non-wicked problem happens twice. It happens in kindergarten, and it happens again in university. And so that's where, that's where you guys are now. But I want you to think about your practice as being more of this stuff, planners and builders. We have to deal with a number of different issues, and all of those issues are interconnected. I want us to think, so that, that diagram might actually make us pause and think that there's nothing to do, actually, and that everything we do is worthless. Um, I want to think a little bit more about some images that might inspire us about how complexity can be a, um, um, uh, a starting point for thinking in deep ways about the project or about potential. And a couple of images I show are natural systems and 
how those natural systems can be mapped or drawn. And the complexity in the drawing echoes the complexity of the system that we're looking at. So this is uh, just some maps of wind moving across a landscape. Um, they've only drawn the wind, uh, different densities and directions of wind. But through that one mapping, through just showing the vector of wind at any given set of points, we can understand or it reveals a number of things about that terrain. We can see the topography, we can see the low points, the places that we might want to stay, the places we might not want to stay. And so just looking at one thing in detail can give us a lot of clues into how to approach complexity. We can look at natural systems a lot for inspiration as well. And um, uh, you'll see a lot of architects, especially 10 or 15 years ago, and landscape architects, looking at um, mimicking biological systems. And so you'll see a lot of um, people looking at swarms of birds or bees or ants, um, looking at fractal patterns and plants and then shorelines, and getting inspiration from that. And I still think that there's something to learn from that, as, especially as technology improves and as um, building technology specifically gets more and more enriched by data practices, data mining, and, and uh, data modeling. Um, but just the forms that come out of that and the sort of uh, the variability and the indeterminacy of that, I think, are sort of inspiring in terms of thinking about complexity. Um, you guys, may, you'll probably see this drawing again um, by Louis Kahn. Has anyone showed it? No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Louis Kahn, an American architect. This is in the 1950s. And in the 1950s, um, most people are thinking about cities in very sort of rational scientific ways. Uh, modernism is, um, uh, is uh, the disciplinary envelope that people are thinking about these problems in. Um, but he, <coughs> and in modernism, there's sort of, uh, there's one right, right, one right way to build the city of the future. Um, it's a very social project, um, but it's a project of the expert telling um, the citizens what they need to do, how they need to live. And Louis Kahn, uh, at least in this, this drawing, goes against the grain a little bit. And as an architect, he is actually not just saying how the city needs to change. He's trying to understand how it works. And he does that, again, by diagram by mapping, just like the wind mapping I showed you in the beginning. Um, and he's understanding how traffic moves in the city. And <clears throat> this drawing reveals a richness of just that one single thing. It's not just a series of lines that are roads. But there's a density, there's a flow, there's speed issues, there's vertical circulation as well as horizontal circulation. And he <clears throat> understands the city, in one layer at least, as this kind of mobile envelope for people moving through the city. And so his, um, his eventual proposal that comes out of this, which I won't show, really just looks at um, signage and visibility and clarity within that system. So he doesn't propose erasing part of downtown uh, Philadelphia and building a bunch of towers. He actually tries to work within that system. And I think that, even though that's in the 1950s, I think that's become more um, of a feasible way to practice today. Um, 